in the PAW Minute Book, it states that every minister that is licensed in the Pentecostal Seminars of the World is expected to preach, practice, and uphold its doctrines and laws as expressed in our minute book. And this is the uh, oath that every licensed minister in the Pentecostal Seminars of the World uh, takes. Unfortunately, we have many of them that have taken that oath and have gone and teach contrary to our doctrine. We have the apostolic doctrine. Apostolic doctrine is simply the teachings of the apostles, what the apostles preached and taught. Now, the apostles wrote the New Testament. And of course, uh, we're going to deal with that eventually, show you by the scriptures, the fact that the apostles had the authority to implement New Testament commandments. They were the interpreters of all points of doctrine. And they preached and taught uh, the doctrine of Christ from the Old Testament scriptures. And this is what they used when they preached because the New Testament had not been written yet. And so they wrote the New Testament based upon the revelation that they have received of the type shadows and patterns that are found in the Old Testament. And also in addition to that, they enacted New Testament commandments uh, because this was the authority that the Lord had given them. And that's how and why we have our New Testament scriptures today. I want you to know that our Bible is complete. Now there are those that would argue the fact that there are other books and other scriptures out there, uh, but keep in mind that we have all that God intended for us to have, 66 books. All the other books that are out there, uh, the Lost Books of Eden, uh, the Gospel according to Barnabas, the uh, book of uh, uh, the Gospel according to Jude, uh, and all of these other apocryphal writings are not God inspired. And in many cases, these books that have these names attached to them were not even written by the individuals that claim that is the author of the book. Now, the only scriptures that are uh, God inspired are the 66 books of our Bible. And that can be proven by uh, the type pattern shadows that's found in the tabernacle uh, which bears out the fact that we were to have 66 pieces of literature known as the 66 books of our Bible so all of these other books that are out there now of course the Catholic Bible has these same 66 books but between the Old and New Testament they have the books called the Apocrypha. And they believe that those books are God inspired also, but they are not. But you do find them, and I have a copy of them in my office. You do find them in the Catholic Bible, and you can find them in stores and whatnot. But we know that those books are not inspired, number one, because Jesus never quoted from them. Jesus quoted from every part of the Old Testament and he never quoted from the Apocrypha nor did the Apostles quote from the Apocrypha so this is the evidence that we have that those books are not God inspired if you read in the 24th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke Jesus last appearance to his disciples he told them that all things that are written in the uh, law and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me had to be fulfilled. That's the entire Old Testament. And so he never quoted from these other apocryphal books, all of these other books that they claim uh, that were written in Bible times, what have you, 
the only sacred writings that we have are the 66 books of our Bible. And so I want to call your attention to the book of Timothy as we start uh, this lesson tonight. Uh, and of course, we're going to let you out in about uh, 45 minutes because we're not going to hold you long. We know it's a little chilly in here. Uh, and of course, we uh, understand that um, we, the holiday is upon us. Praise the Lord. Can we say amen? And, um, and of course, we um, understand that, um, uh, that traffic is uh, pretty heavy out there. Uh, but I want to call your attention to this scripture uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 1. And we want to deal with verse number 1 through 4. Now, this pamphlet that I've given you, I want you to keep up with it and bring it to Bible class with you because we're going to go over it um, word by word, section by section, and show you why we believe what we believe. Now, I used to do this in Michigan, in my church for years, and because we had a young church, a church with college students and college graduates, um, what I did is that I uh, arranged these uh, uh, pages of doctrine in a curriculum form and they were tested out of certain sections. I think there were three exams total out of uh, as, as the 16 pages was broken up into three sections and they were tested out of each section and then eventually there was a final exam where they were tested out of all of the 16 pages and it was not open book. And of course they enjoyed it. And the lowest, the highest score was 100%. The lowest score, because I graded each one of them and I graded them pretty tough, the lowest score was 95. And so they, they, they really enjoyed it. Now I don't know about doing that here. It, it, it depends on whether or not you guys, because I still have all the information. I still have the exams. Uh, and all these type of things. And of course, I had a minister in my church who had been uh, just got married uh, and she had been saved for 22 years. And she finally uh, went to get her license. And of course, if you want to be licensed in the PAW, you have to take a licensing exam. And she said that she never would have passed that exam if she didn't have that training in Bible class concerning our doctrine. But it is very important for us to know what we believe, why we believe it, and this is why we're going over this with you tonight. Now, if some of you want to take up the challenge, I do have the exams. It would be nice if all of our ministers were inspired, say, let me take that, um, but, you know, we're not going to force it on anybody. But, <laughs> well, some of you all, that might be old, like our deacon, uh, might want to take an open book or something. <laughs> no, I'm only joking. But they, you know, but, but, but you know, they, that's how they want to do it. So it worked out fine. So, um, and we did have some that took an open book and they still didn't score 100%. Isn't that something? You know, well, so let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 1. We're going to deal with verse 1 through 4. All right. If we have it, let's read. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior, and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Verse four, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions, rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. Now, what we want to highlight is the last part of verse number three. Uh, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. And that's what we want to talk about tonight. No other doctrine. Now, no other doctrine than what? Well, in our case, 
keep in mind that the book of Timothy is a pastoral epistle. And Paul was writing to not Brother Timothy, but Bishop Timothy. Now, he opens up verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. How? By the commandment of who? God. God commanded him to the apostleship. It wasn't something that he just woke up one day and decided he wanted to be an apostle. It was by the commandment of God. In another place, he said, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the will of God. And so you have many today that like to call themselves apostles. They think so great of themselves that they want to call themselves apostle. And I was uh, in the elevator uh, heading up to the uh, uh, third floor of the radio station to um, uh, do the radio broadcast. And when I came inside the elevator, I saw um, a uh, flyer of a woman that claimed to be an apostle, apostle so-and-so, and she had so much makeup on and lipstick, I felt I could just touch the flyer and get it all over my fingers. It claimed to be an apostle. Now, there were no female apostles. Um, God just didn't call any. It's not because the women are inferior to men at all. He just didn't call any. Now, somebody says, well, why didn't he call a woman? A woman would be an apostle. Well, you can ask him in the rapture. Can we say amen? I don't have all the answers for that, um, but he called 12, the 12 being the apostle Paul, and they were called. See, uh, a lot of people uh, think the ministry is some extracurricular activity. The ministry is the call of God, and it is the highest calling in the world. And there are more people that are trying to be in the ministry that are not called uh, and many of them may be called, but they have not been sent. You see, God will not send a person to pastor anybody if they have not been baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. Because what God does is that you uh, go through three stages. Uh, you are called, then you are prepared, and then you're sent. But the problem is today that many of them are out there and they're not called, and some of them uh, are called and went before they got sent. And this is why we have such a, such a big problem today. Now, I dare say that any minister that starts out to pastor and their church closes up, they haven't been sent. That's just the bottom line. Because they failed. But God does never fail. Is that right? So if God calls you and sends you to pastor, what is your church doing folding up? You're not supposed to fail. So a lot of times, some of our brethren, just because of their ego and their pride, they just don't want to admit that um, they were not sent. I remember the late, great evangelist Marshall Taylor. I'm quite sure you all remember Marshall Taylor. Said that uh, he uh, went out and tried to pastor. Uh, and then he said uh, he was out there for years and nobody got saved. And so he said, well, uh, I guess I ain't been sent. I just went. He went back and got on the field and became a very successful evangelist. And many years later, he um, resumed the pastorate until eventually he died. Now, I think his daughter is, uh, is uh, the pastor of that church now. But be that as it may, we have a lot of them out there that many of them have not been called most of them have not been sent. And you can tell by what happens in their ministry uh, and uh, what they preach. But God calls, prepares, then he sends. And he doesn't send uh, you out alone. Uh, he doesn't send a person out their way. In the 13th chapter of the book of Acts, it lets you know that the Apostle Paul and Barnabas were ordained. And they were ordained and sent out. And the scripture says, and they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost. Now, how did the Holy Ghost send them? Well, first of all, they were at the uh, first national convention, the first apostolic national convention in the 13th chapter of Acts. And of course, the Bible says, the Holy Ghost said, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas for the work that I have for them. And then the scripture says, and when they had fasted and prayed 
and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. And then the next verse says, and they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost. So how does the Holy Ghost sin? The Holy Ghost sins by the hands of other men. Because if Paul and Barnabas were sent out after they were had hands laid upon them and prayed over them, and then the next verse says they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, then the Holy Ghost sends one out from the hands of other men that are in authority over them. That's how it's done. You don't just wake up one morning and uh, decide that you're going to be a preacher and then you just go out and start a church. Well, you can do that if you want to, but you have to anoint yourself. <laughs> we say amen. And I'm not talking about just putting some oil on your forehead. You know, so the problem is, is that many, uh, and as I heard one bishop say, uh, he said 95% of all preachers that say they call are not even called. Because a lot of times they, now that's what he said. That's not what I'm saying. That's what he said. And of course he had like um, uh, 60, 70 years in the ministry. So how can you argue with that? And then of course I'm talking about uh, Bishop Herman who uh, uh, mother was baptized in Jesus name and raised under Bishop Haywood. So he came out of that mother church. And this is what he says. Uh, so be that as it may, when uh, Paul is an apostle by the commandment of God. And then he says, our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith. Now, Timothy was not his biological son. He was his son in the faith. Now, how was that? Well, when Paul met Timothy, he was already a minister, highly recommended in two different cities. And he knew the scriptures better than you and I would ever hope to learn them in a lifetime of study. He was taught the scriptures by his grandmother and his mother. His grandmother, uh, Lois, I believe it was, and his mother, Eunice, or as they pronounced it in that day, Eunice. Now, he was taught the scriptures by his mother and grandmother, but he didn't know what they meant. And so once he met the apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul took him under his wing and trained him for 12 years. And so then he came into the knowledge of the scriptures that he knew what they meant. You see, you can know what the Bible says, but don't know what it means. Can we say amen? You can know what the verses say. You can quote scripture, but that doesn't mean you know what it means. As a matter of fact, you can understand every word in the verse of scripture and know the etymological root word of the word the origin of the word and all these other type of things and still not know what god meant by what he said because it takes the holy ghost to reveal it is that right spiritually discerned so keep in mind then that this is how he was his own son in the faith he took him and raised him and trained him for 12 years in the ministry so this is why he uses this term of endearment, uh, my own son in the faith. Now, it is very unfortunate today that as Paul told the church in Corinth, he said, though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Now, what is he saying? In other words, he's saying you have a lot of Bible teachers, but you don't have very many fathers. Now, he was their father in the gospel because he founded that church in the 18th chapter of Acts. And he was the pastor of that church. Today, we have a lot of preachers. We have a lot of Bible instructors, but we don't have very many fathers fathers that are able to mentor young ministers today now i do have a group of pastors that have asked me to mentor them to try to help them very fine uh, young men and even uh, one sister but this is something that is missing today uh, because our apostolic fathers pretty much have passed off the scene uh, and so some of us that have had many years in the ministry that have been trained by the fathers 
because uh, I was trained in the scriptures by uh, Bishop Ira Combs. And, and of course, uh, my major trainee came from the late Bishop R.P. Paddock, who was the former presiding bishop of the PAW, uh, who trained a lot of us in the scriptures. Uh, but not very many ministers today are willing to be sat down and trained. They want to be recognized as somebody great. But Jesus said, he that is great among you, let him be your what? Servant. Is that right? But we're not interested in being servants today. We're interested in being served. When we get done preaching, we want somebody to come put our cape around us. And I remember one bishop, he was preaching, and someone came put that cape around him, and he had a little slit in the front of it. He stuck his hand out and said, come on and be saved. All you could see is his hand. Of course, he was so dark-skinned in the head on that black cape, you couldn't see nothing but his hand. <laughs> but this is, this is how it is today. Uh, it's about uh, people are using um, the church as a hustle rather than using it uh, as a ministry of Jesus Christ. Well, we're not around here hustling anybody. Can we say, hey, man, I'm trying to hustle myself into heaven by living holy. That's what I'm trying to do. Praise the Lord. All right. So this is how he was his son. In the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Now, in our case, no other doctrine than what? Well, no other doctrine than our minute book. Now, another reason why I decided uh, to do this years ago, to go through our minute book, is I remember the late Bishop Paddock in minister, minister's class when I was attending. I started attending his minister's class from the time I was 16 years old up until uh, he died in 1990. Uh, and so he would say, ask the question, how many of you all have read the minute book? And none of the ministers raised their hands. He said, I'm not surprised about that because I know some pastors that haven't read it. He said, I'm not surprised about that. He said, because I know some district elders that haven't read it. He said, I guess I'm not too surprised about that because I know some bishops that haven't read it. This is our doctrine. This is what we believe. And this is what uh, shows us why we believe what we believe. And so this is why we are very strong in this church on the teachings of the fathers because the fathers Bishop Haywood, and Bishop Paddock, and Bishop Golder, and many of the others uh, gave us the foundation of all of the knowledge that we have of God today. Late Bishop Carl F. Smith and all these. Uh, uh, Bishop uh, Douglas was one of the fathers. Bishop Schultz was one of the fathers. Uh, but they're all gone now. And so we have to continue um, the doctrinal stand that they took because this is the only thing that's going to save us in these last days. Most teaching and preaching has gone philosophical. It's gone philosophical. Not biblically based, but philosophical. And if we're going to be saved, it's going to take the unadulterated word of God that's going to get us into heaven. Can we say amen? And if we're not getting that and getting something else, it's not going to get us into heaven. All right? So... Um, here, as we told you before, uh, this, these are some excerpts from our minute book that contain our doctrine. And we're going to go over it uh, and deal with some of the scriptures. Uh, you may have some questions concerning it later on uh, after class. And of course, we're going to let you out at 830 uh, because, um, you know, it's a little chilly in here. Uh, I think everybody's a little chill, except Brother Jeffries, because he's got that porcupine coat on. <laughs> I'm not sure. That's not porcupine. That's, that's, uh, that's, that, that's the real thing. You know, uh, uh, Deacon Charles will wear porcupine, but he's got the real thing on. All right, there. Somebody says, what about the rabbit's foot? Well, I don't believe in the rabbit's foot being luck, because it didn't do very good for the rabbit, did it? <laughs> So if it didn't help the rabbit, how's it going to help me? Praise the Lord. All right. So you can follow along. Um, in, um, so we hope, you that, hope that everyone has one. And again, keep up with this. Um, keep up with it. Uh, study it. It gives you something to study well, when you get home. Now, I've had ministers ask me, uh, tell me, I don't know what to study in the Bible. What do I study? I said, study the minute book. 
This contains 16 pages of our doctrine. Now, uh, understand that they're not printing the minute book anymore. <laughs> we do have some that don't believe in this doctrine anymore. But as you can see with all these scriptures, it's backed up by the Bible. All right? But I believe in it because this is the word of God. The Pentecostal Simmons of the world uh, doctrine is the apostolic doctrine. And it is the most complete apostolic doctrine than any other Jesus-only organization unless they follow what we have uh, to the T. Now, how did these uh, minute book get compiled with these doctrines? Well, many of these things are the result of doctrinal conferences that the Pentecost Assemblies of the World has had over the years to settle doctrinal differences to discover in the scripture what is the truth concerning certain doctrinal points. And of course, as we told you, the apostles were the interpreters of all points of doctrine. And today, the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World Executive Board are the interpreters of all points of doctrine. And of course, uh, there have been times in the PAW history where we had to meet, to where, where the Executive Board had to meet to establish what is the truth for the rest of the constituency, that's us, for us to know what does the Bible say concerning this subject. Now, that is biblical because the first doctrinal conference on record in your Bible is found in the 15th chapter of the book of Acts. And do you know what the discussion was about? Circums the Jews and the Gentiles. That's right, Deacon. The Jews and the Gentiles concerning circumcision. Since the Gentiles have now come into the church, do they have to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses? And down through the years during the PAW's history, since 1907, um, up until now, during our history, we have had doctrinal issues of which we had the organization, the leaders had to meet and discuss through the scriptures what is the truth. Now, our last doctrinal conference occurred in 1988, and I believe it was out of Indianapolis, Indiana, over the issue of unconditional eternal security. And, of course, in your pamphlet, you will find that they came to a conclusion. Uh, I think it was a week-long um, discussion, and I have those tapes and recordings uh, in my library. And when one of our bishops, the late Bishop uh, Arthur Brazier out of Chicago, Illinois, who was pastoring at that time, the largest church in the PAW, 10,000 plus. Now he had 10,000 in the, in the seats. He's not like these preachers today that got, uh, 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 10,000, uh, that, that, that got 20 and 40,000 and they church only seats five or 10,000 because they're counting all the people that send them offerings in the mail. He had actually 10,000 sitting in the house. And he taught that uh, once saved, always saved. And because he was such a profound uh, Bible teacher and leader, it began to affect the organization. And so there had to be a doctrinal conference to settle the issue as to what the Pentecostal Seminaries of the World's position on this matter is. And so he brought the view, uh, presented his view on unconditional eternal security, which is the a Calvinistic view and the late Bishop Paddock brought the opposing view that we are only secure in Christ if we meet all of his requirements and then of course each bishop was allowed to ask questions concerning their views um, and um, then each bishop was allowed to present their view and the consensus was that unconditional eternal security is not biblical doctrine and we put it in our minute book our stand against that form of teaching you see uh, it's called Calvinism that's part of Calvinism and John Calvin uh, was one that uh, believed that God has ordained some to be saved and some to be lost and that there's nothing you can do about it if you have been chosen to be lost it doesn't matter how you live, you're going to be lost. If you have been chosen to be saved, it doesn't matter how you live, you're going to be saved. And that's not what the Bible teaches. 
And of course, it deals with predestination and all those type of things. But we don't believe that. Now, uh, the, the Baptist faith, and we're not trying to speak disrespect to the Baptists because I have some Baptist friends, and some of them are ministers. Um, the Baptist churches, the differences between the Baptist faith, because there's all kinds of different Baptist denominations, they differ based upon the five points of Calvinism. The doctrine of Calvinism has five points to it. And some of the Baptist churches believe in all or some of them, and that's basically the difference. And the reason why the Baptists do not emphasize living free from sin is because they believe that you, some are chosen to be saved and some are chosen to be lost. They call it irresistible grace, and it's not based upon what you do as far as how you live. It's based upon what God did on Calvary. That's Calvinism. And that's why they don't emphasize living free from sin because they say nobody can live free from sin and it doesn't matter. It's not about you. It's about what Jesus did on Calvary. Now you have some of the charismatic um, denominations, the word of faith churches that teach the same thing, that it is by God's grace that Jesus died for the sins that are past, present, and future. And so it doesn't matter whether you live holy or not. Your sins are always covered. And of course, that is uh, not true. That's not what the Bible teaches. And so in our minute book here, um, it contains 16 pages of our doctrine. And it shows you why we believe what we believe. And it gives you the scriptures to back it up. And some of these scriptures we will look at to clarify a little more. All right. So let's look at our creed, discipline, rules of order, and doctrine. And we got about... Uh, I think that clock is slow. I got about 20 after. What time is it? 18 after. All right. Uh, so that clock is a little slow. All right. Our creed, discipline, rules of order, and doctrine. Now it says our creed, discipline, rules of order, and doctrine is the what? The word of God as taught and revealed by the Holy Ghost. St. John chapter 14, verse 26 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 through 13. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect thoroughly. Now in the Bible, it says throughly, but it means the same thing. Thoroughly or throughly furnished unto all good works. And that's 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. As members of the body of Christ, which is the true church. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. The word of God declares but one way of entrance therein. And that is by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. And that is a baptism of water and spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 through 27. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 through 28. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and 4. St. John chapter 3, verse 5. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Now, I want to make a comment on this, and I will be giving you comments based upon certain sections to give you the history behind some of these um, um, uh, sections that we have here. The part where it says the word of God declares but one way of entrance therein. And that is by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. There are those that like to say that the other Pentecostal denominations, the Assemblies of God and the Churches of God in Christ, and we're not trying to speak disrespect of them because I know I have friends in, in both of those. Um, there are those that believe that they are just as saved as we are because they, some of them have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And because the scripture says, by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, they use that scripture to support that because they say they have the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the Bible says by one spirit are we all baptized in one body. Well, when it says by one spirit, it means by one operation. And when you talked about being baptized into one body, it says here, and that is a baptism of water and spirit. You see, being born again is all one baptism, water and spirit. 
It takes water and spirit to make a full birth. Just like in the natural, when the mother is pregnant, she gets pregnant because the father begets the seed in her womb. That's begetto. Now, begetto and birth is two different things. A man begets, a woman gives birth. So just because it has been begotten, begotten and born is two different things. And 1 John chapter 5 lets you know that. So when the seed has been begotten, there's no birth. You have a whole nine months to go. And then once the pregnancy comes full term, the water breaks first, then the blood, then the child comes out, and then you have the birth. The new birth is the same fashion. The begetto comes when the word is convicted in the heart of the sinner. That's when they have been begotten. What is that conviction? And they're brought to repentance. So then it starts right there when the word comes and it has begotten them at that point. Now, are they born? No. They come down to the altar in repentance. And what happens before the birth takes place? The water breaks first. What's the water? Water baptism. What's the blood? The name Jesus. And when they come up out of the water after being baptized, if they have fully repented and fully believed, God will fill them with the Holy Ghost and they should come out of the water speaking in other tongues as the Spirit of God gives utterance, which is what Paul said. He has sent forth his spirit into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. Just like when that newborn babe comes out of that womb crying, when they come up out of the womb of the water baptism, they're supposed to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, they don't get the Holy Ghost because they haven't fulfilled the requirements of baptism. What is that? They haven't fully repented. They haven't fully believed. And so what they got to do, they got to get down and tarry to do what they should have been done before. <laughs> that means they weren't fully dead. You see, we baptize a lot of live folk. How do we know? Though? We don't know. I remember one young lady came to the altar, my church in Michigan. She said, uh, I want to be baptized, but I don't want the Holy Ghost. I said, well, then you're not qualified to be baptized. I said, because that let me know that you are not finished doing what you want to do. <laughs> and uh, then I instructed her with the scriptures. Then she came convicted. Uh, we baptized her. She came out of the water. God filled her with the Holy Ghost right away. She didn't even have to tarry. You know. So um, that's what happens. When we baptize people and they don't get the Holy Ghost, that means they weren't ready for baptism. But we don't know because we can't see into their hearts. And so what they got to do is that they got to get on their knees and tarry. What are they trying to do? Fulfill the requirements of baptism that they should have done before. And come to a state of repentance come to a state of faith, and as soon as they meet God's requirements, boom, he immediately fills them with the Holy Ghost. And that validates then their baptism because when God fills with the Holy Ghost, that's the Spirit giving witness to the fact that they have repented and believed. Now, when I was teaching on the radio the other day, uh, I made the point. I said, now, there's a preacher that likes to say that baptism uh, is... Uh, uh, not significant, that it doesn't do anything. And I said, and of course he testified that when he got baptized, there was no change. I said, I want to tell all Louisville why there was no change, because he didn't repent. That's why. I said, it is true, just like he said. He went down a dry center and came up a wet center and still a center. Now I had to get off of that real quick because I didn't want the radio station to get at me. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. So when he told you he went down a dry center, came up a wet center, that's exactly what happened because he did not repent. Peter said, repent and be what? Baptized. Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. I said, so just because you didn't get the Holy Ghost when you got baptized, don't sit up and say that what we're talking about is not right. I said, because we just had four folk and four uh, uh, Sundays in succession get baptized in Jesus' name, God filled the Holy Ghost. I said that on the radio. Oh, the truth is wonderful, isn't it? All right, we only got two minutes, and I think we're going to wrap it up here. So many of our brethren 
That's why they fellowship and preach non-apostolics because they believe that they're just as saved as we are. Now, remember, Jesus said, except the man be born of what? Water and the Spirit, you cannot what? Enter into the kingdom of God. Now, who said that? So then, what if I've been born of the water and don't have the Spirit? Can I get in? Why? Because Jesus said, is that right? What if I've been born of the Spirit and haven't been in the water? Can I get in? Now, the kingdom of God, the spiritual kingdom of God is God's church on earth today. How you get into God's church by one spirit, by one operation. What is that operation? It's the one baptism. What is that? Water and spirit. Are we all baptized into what? One body. You see, folk that have the Holy Ghost, because God will give anyone the Holy Ghost if they meet the requirements according to the scripture. See, my wife got the Holy Ghost before she got baptized. She got the Holy Ghost while she was changing into baptism clothes. You know. But people that have the Holy Ghost but have not been baptized in Jesus' name, they are still in sin. Because the baptism in Jesus' name is for the what? Remission of sins. That's the only way you can get your sins washed away. You have to go down in the water, which means you have to be buried, because he said buried with him by what? Baptism. That's why we use water, because water buries you, and then the blood that was shed on Calvary is applied to your life when we say in the name of who? Jesus Christ. And if the person has fully repented and believed, then their sins are washed away. But the evidence that their sins are washed away is that God fills them with the Holy Ghost. That's why when Cornelius and his household received the Holy Ghost in the 10th chapter of Acts, they had been preaching. They didn't think the Jews or they didn't think the Gentiles uh, had the opportunity for salvation. So when Peter went to Cornelius' house and preached to him and the Holy Ghost fell on him, he turned to the six Jews that went with him, said, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? They got the Holy Ghost just like we got it 10 years ago. And the Bible says that he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And I want to tell every Assemblies of God and every Church of God in Christ and every charismatic that has the baptism of the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues, you are commanded to be baptized in the name of Jesus. It is a commandment. Can we say amen? And that's all the time we have because you all are looking so cold. <laughs> and I'm up here doing all the work. Well, that's why we cold because we just, I understand. Praise the Lord. So this is what we're going to be going through for the next series of Bible classes covering uh, these 16 points, uh, these 16 pages of doctrine. And if you haven't gotten one, uh, see uh, Brother Cordy has them. And uh, we're going to be going through this to show you what we believe and why we believe it. So keep up with this. Can you say amen? amen. Keep up with it. I don't want to see one laying around. Because if you do, I'm going to pick it up. Praise the Lord. Are there any questions tonight? Any questions? All right. Thank you for coming. God bless you. Pray for Sister Rhoda uh, in a special way. Um, and uh, we will be back here. Now, of course, um, you know, our, we have some more issues with our boiler. And um, they're going to try to get it fixed as soon as possible. But we will not have it fixed by Sunday. <laughs> 